Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, and as we talk about 2020 Vision by Stephen H. Broadnax III. So I'm really happy to be able to have this conversation with three of the main makers of this piece. So I'll start off with uh, introducing myself. So my name is Gina Pisasal. I'm the resident dramaturg at People's Light. I go by she, her pronouns. I identify as Asian American, and I have been at People's Light for eight and a half years now already. And I'm going to throw it to Steve now to introduce himself. Of course, my name is Steve H. Broad next to third. I go by he, him pronouns. I identify as a man of African descent. So I go African American, Black American male. Um, People's Light Association. I've been with People's Light for a while now. So I've been at People's Light directing and also writing. Um, recently, this season, before everything took um, a turn um, and every in American theater pretty much shut down, um, I had a piece that I had uh, written that was uh, and supposed to be produced on the main stage. So I've been with People's Light as a director for, what, Gina, five years now? It was 2016 when you came for Mountaintop. Wow. So yeah. Yeah, about four, almost five years. So I've been there directing as an artist. That's great. So Eric, I'll throw it to you. Hello, my name is Eric B. Robinson Jr. Um, I go by he, him, his. I am Black uh, American, um, African American, whichever you would like to prefer. Uh, I also have uh, worked with People's Light, um, actually with Steve um, in Mud Row. Uh, by Dominique Marie. So, yeah, so that's how I, I, I've worked with People's Light. I'm also uh, a graduate of Penn State uh, graduate program, mm -hmm. um, where mm -hmm. X was the uh, head of MFA over there. Um, and I know Amkar because he is a BFA, right, Amkar? Mm -hmm. Yep, BFA over there. And uh, we worked with, he worked with us during Mud Row. Uh, so, you know, and Gina, you know, you my girl, trauma turf, bro. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, this is one big happy family. Great. Uh, I'm Omkar Girish Burundari. I identify as a man of Indian descent, uh, Indian American. Uh, so, my pronouns is he, him. I uh, worked on this project as the editor for this project, and my affiliation with all you beautiful people is mean I met all of y'all during my bro. I mean, Steve, I know from school, Steve and Eric. Eric was there when uh, I remember it was one semester before Eric graduated. I get to, got to know Eric then. Steve is a, still is the head of MFA program at Penn State, the PSU gang over here. So, and Gina, we worked together on Monroe. And my affiliation with People's Light last year. I was uh, fortunate enough to work as the assistant to the director, the great Steve Broadnax, on Mud Row, and Eric performed in that, and Gina was our lovely dramaturg. So that's how I know y'all. How yes. we, it was we a, all that was a wonderfully collaborative room. And then, so yeah. Steve, can you talk about your connection to Penn State? Because this is, was the co-production, 2020 Vision is a co-production with Penn State as well, so. Yes, um, well, as the, uh, the guy said, I am, um, well, Currently, our program is on pause, um, our MFA program. The last class we graduated was actually Eric, um, was the last class we graduated. And there are talks of it coming back, and it's on pause now. But still, I'm the head of the MFA acting program at Penn State. I've been at Penn State, believe it or not, um, 17 years. I'm a um, full-time tenure professor there. I um, uh, also am the... Um, uh, <laughs> um, the associate director of outreach for our professional component, which is Pennsylvania Center Stage. So that's how I was able to put these two entities together, um, my work at, and being commissioned um, as a quick commission by People's Light um, in response to the Black Lives Matters protest. They, you guys reached out to me, um, my interest in a quick commission, and then I grabbed Penn State because um, I work on, on with them on season planning and as the Associate Director of Outreach and said, hey, guess what? I'm doing this project here. It would be cool, and they were very interested in well, as well for you two entities um, to work together. And all PSU is a part of it. Eric is in it. Umkar is a part of it. So it just made sense that collaborative 
on the uh, collaboration between these two institutions to get together for this project. That's great. So speaking of the beginnings of this project, Steve, I was wondering if you can talk about the origin, maybe for yourself, like personally, personally, kind of like just emotional entry points, considering the world right now. So considering COVID and then considering the George Floyd murder and then all of the uprising that has happened since then. Um, so I don't know it, like where you can kind of mark your sensibilities to um, when Zach Berkman, our producing artistic director, came to you and said, so what do you think? Like if you can mark where you were in terms of that question and then where or how you even came to the, this thought or this idea for this piece. Um, yes, I remember exactly. I remember um, the murder of George Floyd had happened. Um, and that was what I was just engrossed in every day. And then being isolated and quarantined because of the pandemic that's happening. So the world was crazy. My mindset was in disbelief that this was all happening. You know, I just, I, I, I couldn't even have imagined we would have been where we are and were at the time. I think the pandemic alone was, was, was you know, uh, profound. And then on top of that, the murder of George Floyd and then the, these protests that began. And that's what was on the news every day um, that I would just wake up in the, in the morning and watch and be inundated with these images. And then the image of George Floyd that kept playing over and over again. Then the fear of our, uh, uh, you can't go outside and leave your home. I mean, you can't get some of your basic needs foods, um, um, grocery stores. I mean, it, it was just like the world was in disarray. And I remember getting this um, email from Zach saying, hey, we want to, are you interested? We want to open a space for you if you're interested to, to um, um, we would like to commission you something for in response to the Black Lives Matter protests and all that is going on. Um, and really the first line of the play um, 2020 can kiss my fill in the blank. Um, that's how I felt, you know what I mean? I was going, you know, when 2020 came, I remember New Year's, it felt like, oh, this is something great that's going to happen. It's 2020, y'all. It's, it's going to be great. And it sucked. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and, and it was like, oh, and again, for me, it started with Kobe. I remember I, it's just things started to happen. Um, on a grand scale that I was just like, the world is going berserk and crazy. So when I got the call, that's where I was. It was just really living and igniting in me all these things and just basic need of survival of all this. And then being, uh, you know, a, a man of African descent, a black male, to see that just affected me to my core, like it resounded around the world. You know, it was, a, this is the probably in my lifetime, the most prolific event that has happened in our history is now to me. And so when I got the opportunity to express that, it was just right here all on the surface, you know, for me that I just sat down and was like, yes, you know, 2020. And, and then I just kept thinking, you know, 2020 and vision and what does this mean and trying to make meaning out of all that was happening in our current events. Where did you think, when, when did the idea of a man in his car come um so zach said hey you want to do you would you like to do something like, yeah and he and i was like yeah and he was like and who you know would you like to do with like eric because he knew eric from mud row and i said oh i love eric for sure let's go eric i and me and eric are not only we work together i've edged work in education but he's my friend as well and i love he's like a muse for me in collaboration and i just love that man and, and forever everything i do i try to put him in and so i was like oh eric eric he's easy to work with i, I can trust him he trusts me and we have a great conversation so i had been on other projects that are trying to because now we're all everything zoom right we're trying to figure out how do we as artists continue art and creating art limited and we're innately a form for life performance how does it work and i've been a part of other projects 
that were trying to figure out that Zoom element or live performance on Zoom. So, and to me, it, it the, the mediums don't match. You know what I mean? Live performance is live performance. We're never going to be able to take that away or substitute it for anything else. I don't care how hard you try, it's not going to work. And it's not very interesting to me. So I said, how can I get it to work? What is this, what new and how can I collaborate in a way that is still written for this medium? So I, I thought for myself, film it. You know what I mean? I was like, oh, we, we're going to use the, the, you know, the medium of like a journal, but from video camera phone, I'm going to use all of those elements that I have to in the narrative. So that's how I came up with it. That's great. So Eric, when did you come into the process and what was your first impression of the piece? Or, I mean, I don't know if you and Steve had a conversation first or if Steve sent you the script first, or I'm curious about how you entered into the piece and your um, thoughts about like, this is going to be me in a car <laughs> talking yeah. to 20 pages. Look, Let's go. It was, like, I'm just curious. <laughs> it was, it was probably one of the more challenging things that I've ever had to do. Um, just because the, the script, you know, there was it's 25, 28 minute video. So the script was like 12 to 13 pages long. And, uh, and I wanted to memorize the entire thing. And I wanted to let it sit inside my spirit, let it shizzle in my spirit. And, uh, and so Steve came to me immediately. He was like, E. I <laughs> so I was like, word? Right when everyone across, you know, the nation, artists across the nation are experiencing, you know, shows stopping, you know, where, you know, a lot of people are just not, or just missing out on work, you know, opportunities. And so I was completely grateful. And then when I heard that it was with People's Light, um, you know, I love People's Light so much, man. And I think, well, People's Light was is the theater that my first professional gig uh, coming out of grad school was at People's Light. So um, I, I was just excited to do a piece with them, with you all. And, um, and then to have a co-pro with Penn State, my alma mater, uh, beautiful. I was like, perfect, I'm on board. And so, you know, he told me the idea and I was like, oh, okay, like a selfie video, that makes sense. What a great way to kind of transition, right? Um, because I know uh, immediately I knew that I was going to have to wear several hats in, in this project, um, you know, from scouting locations to hunting down props mm -hmm. to being the cameraman to, you know, uh, even there were several iterations that I had with different police officers in the film. And so I had to essentially be a casting director um and so it was it was it was a very you know all these hats had you just had to be a flexible eclectic type of artist to kind of pull this off and so you know that was the challenge in it and it was it was super exciting and when steve was on board i was immediately on board uh steve is my brother so um you know anything that that he touches i'm i'm i'm, I'm glad to be a part of so um yeah i mean it, like i said it was one of the most challenging things that i've ever done though just because of the sheer amount of memorization that was required and and usually it's funny because every time i tell someone i'm, I'm an actor you know uh they're always like how do you memorize all those <laughs> words and i you know i usually tell them well a check helps uh but but this was the most memorization i've ever had to do but um, I think with Steve, we had, we worked closely uh, with, you know, as far as crafting it and letting it kind of sit on my tongue. And because he know he knows that I'm a father, um, you know, he knows uh, that, you know, I'm a black man in America. Uh, I've experienced, uh, you know, a lot of these things kind of run parallel to my life, the things that Nate experienced uh, and the things that I've experienced. And, you know, Steve had conversations with other black men as well. And, uh, and that's how he was able to kind of piece all these pieces in. And, and when I heard the story, I was just like, I was like, wow. You know, every time, he, you know, when, I, when I'm reading it, when he read it to me, I'm like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. That happened to me. Oh, my gosh. I go through that. Oh, my gosh. I experienced that. And so that made it a little more less taxing to, to, to memorize um, just because I had experienced those experiences. So. You know, it, like I said, one of the most challenging things, but probably one of the more rewarding things I've done so far as an actor. That's great. Can I ask, I know, were you, can I ask where you were when you were filming exactly? Yeah, so I was in Texas. So as soon as coronavirus, uh, as soon as coronavirus was, you know, New York was the hotspot for coronavirus, I flew me and my family to Texas 
and um, <laughs> which later didn't make sense because Texas became the hub. Uh, but but yeah, that's where you're. That's, you're from Texas. Yeah, I'm from. Yeah, so I went back home I, essentially. Uh, but Eric, you didn't. That film wasn't in Texas. Oh yes, the final iteration was in Washington D.C. Yes, so it was. Um, uh, I didn't I was, do that. Wow. Yeah. 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 So I had I had two in Texas, and then I would had the final one in D.C. Um, uh, so you know there was some downtown areas, and then there was a more residential area, and I felt like I, I really liked the the trees in the residential area um um you know i i you know i kind of went back and forth between like should it be in more of a metropolitan downtown but then when you talk about the logistics of like finding parking and then you know being able to move from one spot to the next spot and hoping that that parking spot would be open there was so many different you know things that kind of played into making this you know one cohesive piece uh for me anyway and and it just it made more sense and it was better for me to be in a more residential area um and i just hope that you know a more metropolitan area was conveyed through the video but you know even getting out of the car and yelling uh <laughs> there were so many times when 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 people were just looking at me and then looking around and then looking at themselves to like are is he yelling at me and so i i clearly i felt like a crazy person um, I know I look like a crazy person, but you know, as an actor, you just got to keep going. You got to go roll with the punches. So, so yeah. I love, that I love that this was filmed in DC just for the larger gesture of that actually. So, <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of like all of the logistics and actual of the making. So Ankar, can you tell me a little bit about what you, what your part of this process was? Um, I mean, maybe also give it your thoughts of, you know, when maybe you got the script for the first time um, where you were and then like, what was, what is the, what is the process of an editor on something like this? Yeah. So I remember it was like, it was Sunday and it was like early morning. Steve messaged me. Steve was like, uh, I got this project. I would love to talk to you about it. I was like, if Steve tells me something, I'm on it like already. Because last year when I worked on Mud Row with all three of you, that was the best experience I had working period. So I was like, anytime I can be in the room and with any of y'all, I was like, I'm gonna do it. So I don't even, Steve called me up. Steve's like, okay, this is the project. This is a concept which I'm going with. I would love you to come on board, be an editor. We're, we're thinking about it to be a film style stuff. So can you uh, help me on the editing aspect of it? And he said, Eric's on it. I'm like, Eric's like my big brother. I, I'm on it for real. Like now, now I've got to do it. People's light is in it. And say, I was like, oh my God, this is a big thing. Like I was like, this 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 been a blow up this, this is something this and then then uh steve sent me the script i read the script and the first time i read the script i i was already tearing up because i was like everything i felt what i'm not i can't consider myself to be at uh like experiencing everything that uh, nate's character has experienced but seeing people who i know and people who i care about experience that in at least in the environment in state college, which I live in, I was like, okay, this is something which I had no idea when I came to America, that this was such a big issue of racism played such a big, big part in, in the nature of this country. So um, when I got the opportunity to do it, I was like, okay, I'm gonna come in. And I told Steve, this is going to be premium. This is going to be the best, <laughs> best work, period. We're going to make this like for Steve, it's always going to be 110%. So I came on board, I got the script and um, Steve, uh, Steve sent me over videos, which Eric shot. And um, I spent a couple of uh, just hours that entire day, just going, going back. Cause this came around, uh, around uh, July. And I know when, uh, uh, when the George Floyd murder and Breonna Taylor murder and Ahmed Aubrey, that happened around the period of, uh, up till my birthday around June and late May. So I went through Twitter, just kept on stro scrolling through Twitter and looking at footage and footage and footage and try to grab stuff, watching performances, because a lot of artists came up with more and more 
performances based around that period. Like one big thing was uh, Denzel Curry, the rapper, had a video called Pig's Feet, which I drew some inspiration from. And so that's how I came in. And then I just created like, uh, Steve knows I like to like create like these like uh, mood boards and stuff like, okay, this, this is the idea I'm working with. How do you feel about this? How do you like this? So I just like started like just creating ideas which would work, try to figure out what's, what's our time limit and whatnot. And moreover, just try to get the tone and whatever Steve, just make sure whatever Steve wants, that's what's gonna happen. Like to get that story in. The story is what matters the most. It means the visuals and whatnot, but I needed to make sure that the tone and the message really hits in. And that was what I was just aiming for. So. As an editor, my, working with, with Steve and Eric, it's always fun. It's always easy because they know what they want and I just, just help them make their, make their job easier. That's great. So and, <laughs> and can I add, he's being humble also that he is the glue that put this together. Like it never would have been what it had been without Umkar. His, his vision, his, it, from take the, my ideal and story, he took it into a place that I could not have even imagined. I, you know, I hoped it was going to be premium. I always try to put my best foot forward in the work that I do, but I could not, it was not in my discourse to what it would end up looking like and being, and without the glue of um Umkar, he's, he's responsible for that. Yeah. I was gonna uh, say, Umkar, that you have a very, um, very, uh, like kind of experience in terms of video editing and that so uh that experience was why you are of course on steve's top to call <laughs> for sure so. Thank you so, much. <laughs> so that's great so were all three of you ever in the room together ever or was it all of your work mm -hmm. all through zoom calls or video calls umkar and i were together uh, one time. So we met and, and had a session together in person, but the rest of the time, like it was always on Zoom. Like Eric um, was traveling and him and I would have Zoom like readings when we would go through the script together and talk line by line and him read it to me and edits. I would always, you know, as I was writing, because I wrote with it with Eric in mind, knowing he was going to be the actor, I could always go, oh no, Eric, you know, what, what do you think about this? And I, I believe in collaboration. I'm such a big man of collaboration because um, Eric li has to live the experience. So I really count on the actor to kind of tell me, you know, I can write all day and have it in my mind, but Eric, uh, the performer, has to live it. So I would just lean on him on even his notes or his thoughts so that we can really get it tailored to him. Um, and so Eric and I worked on Zoom. Um, then Mkar and I worked on in person. And then we would just phone calls, you know, in, in Zoom. Yeah. Eric, I was really interested in the non-textual pieces of the, of, the pro of, the, of the piece in general also, especially when people would walk by the car. And I thought... The one, there was one moment where a white gentleman with an elephant on his shirt, actually, I don't know, like walk wow. and the look, and then there's also another like blank, a black gentleman that walked on his shirt. And yeah. I'm curious if you can talk about the moments where like people would walk by, cause you would look and genuinely look mm -hmm. at people. Which wasn't, you know, it's not in the script that like white man walks by, black man walks by. Yeah, yeah. Where, can you, I, you know, talk to me about like the the performative and the reality that was kind of meeting up at that moment, at those moments. Yeah, it was so crazy. It was. Um, I think I was so immersed in the circumstance, so on edge. Um, I think it fed a lot of the kind of quick riffs. Uh, this man, you know, he's he's been placed in a position where he wants to do something. And then he wants to let his son know um, why he is about to do what he's about to do. And it's, and it's uh, you know, it's a very adrenalized kind of thing uh, that he's about to, to take on. And so every time, you know, something happened in my environment, I always want to not ignore it, right? So, you know, MFA, my MFA at Penn State taught me that, I think, uh, it says something happens in, you know, in the audience or on stage to use it. You know, a lot of times that's the, the whole beauty behind live performances. You never know what's going to happen. 
But if you ignore it, then it takes away the uh, the suspension of disbelief, right? So uh, it, it, I think just with people walking through, I, I had to, to to gauge them to see what they were going to do to see if they, you know, and I think Nate was so on edge that every time something happened, um, I, I just, I couldn't ignore it. And I think those, those are the, the, the beautiful moments though, the, the moments that you look at and you're like, wow, you know, that it, it felt real, you know, it seemed real. And there was, like you said, this blend of um, reality and, you know, performance. Uh, and I thought it was, it was, it was some lovely touches. Um, but yeah, so I, I couldn't have asked you know, plan for that. Um, you know, these, I was just in somebody's neighborhood and people were walking around. So um, I was just happy to be able to use them. Uh, I wish I could get their names so I could put them in the credits as well. But, but it was, it was, it was some beautiful moments. I was also noticing in this form because it's you on such a cool screen that like even just watching like the sweat on your forehead, I was like, that is a good, acting realism there going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a combination of sun and hot ass car. <laughs> <laughs> so um Steve, there's one moment in the play that I'm so curious about. As a dramaturg, I always look to, you know, how one event affects the next, affects the next, affects the next. To me it's well, you know, one a trail of dominoes. And there's um, one place in particular where Nate sees a protest happening and there's dancing that breaks out. And then he's just like, what is this? And then, you know, like, what's that radio station? The music comes, there's video, there's montage of protests that comes in. And then we get in and we have a celebration that goes back to, you know, just kind of African roots, like kind of celebration of why music, why dance. Um, and then we have that knock on the window by a police officer. Um, so I'm just wondering, within the context of what you're asking of an audience in 2020 vision, to talk us through maybe like just the the turns the, of Nate during that section of the play. Yes. Um, and what I love when dramaturgs and um, brilliant people like you, Gina, uh, read it, it and what people find meaning in, I go, wow. Uh, and then I can then I tell you how I constructed it. <laughs> well, I, I always knew that I knew Eric, it was a solo show. I always thought that. And I knew just structurally that I had to continue to change values as far as in moods in order to keep attention. You know what I mean? Just for the viewer. I was like, I, I, I cannot, I, I wanted the piece to have, to have humor. I, you had to like Nate, you know what I mean? And enjoy for us to watch with him, one man and a single shot, cause we didn't have cut to him getting in, cut to his home when he got up that morning. You know, I knew I didn't have those elements. So I said, how can I do that? And it was just structuring the piece that it kept moving and turning on itself in mood as far as in value, right? So, and that's my favorite moment. And Eric, I, I laugh every time he, Sydney takes of that because it was so funny to me because how he would then look and it became this joyous, this dancing and this positive then to be interrupted by the very thing that has caused or represents the inciting event of brutality of black bodies, right? And so I just loved that that juxtaposition of that extreme turn that I knew was a way to, to grab attention and to for even him to get a larger dimension of who this man was. Because I, I, as a human being, I think it's messy, you know what I mean? To have him get out the car and literally dance and joyous in that way, and then to turn it on his head completely, just humanized him to me and made it not clean or binary, or it was complex. He's complex, the situation 
is complex. So it was constructed that way in order to expand his dimension, but also to, I knew that viewers were watching one single shot for a long time, that there were ways that I can construct the text that it kept switching and changing on itself in value. Yeah, I really appreciate the complexity of just that small chunk of text where what you're saying is the humanity enters and where there are any almost there are so many different entry points for so many diverse audience members in that moment. So it's mm -hmm. just, you know, how when we've seen like pictures of dancing at protests, it's like, you know, that thought of just like, what, what is happening? You know, exactly. who, does that, who does that kind of like response belong to? And mm -hmm. then, you know, like, what, what is this? Oh, that is. I love that's that's a good that's some good music that happening and then dance happens but then it gets into like deep cultural history like mm -hmm. celebrational individual mm -hmm. but larger you know mm -hmm. racialized cultural history and mm -hmm. then to like back to that single moment of you know what sparked mm -hmm. all of this conversation so it starts mm -hmm. you know kind of with all of us and then it, mm -hmm. it kind of gets gets bigger and celebrational and in a culturally specific way and then you know, kind of comes back to this finite mm -hmm. moment. So I, I just thought like in that short amount of time, it's just such a wonderful structuring and in such great uh, complex humanity, like you're saying too. Yeah. So, and, and I want to give shots out to Zach too, because he like, there have been versions, there were versions of the text, right? And I remember Zach, you know, I love working with Zach um, um, at People's Lights. And he sent me back and that, and, and Gina, you may have seen the different scripts because that it wasn't where it was at one point. Um, and then when the order kind of, there was a, a suggestion to like, okay, I kind of just want to know, you know, more about him getting into his son after he parks. Like, I, it's things just shifted and when the piece got shifted it, it just it just connected and I was going oh, that's it that was it so yeah yeah it's great it's really wonderful so I want to talk to, about um, two pieces uh, of the text as well just like kind of putting them um, up together and um, Eric I'm interested in your experience of like just the ride going from this moment to this moment yeah. Two pieces I'm talking about. One that starts with uh, we march and we voted, and still ain't shit changed. We need reform. You know, so number eight, eight stop and five, stop, five, stops. Mm -hmm. These police officers, the four of us, murder, manslaughter. We go back to America normal, and then we continue and said so. I mean it, let it burn. Fire move. So there's this emotional landing point. That you have to. Mm -hmm. And then when you're speaking to your son at the end, um, you say, Turn the dark now, be discouraged by the dark spot. You know, darkness is not permanent at all. Uh, you know, the beginning of darkness, the beginning of darkness is a new renewal. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we last, but last, but we see it, but we have to know. It. So this offering of change, of hope. So I'm curious if those are actually felt like two different places for you, and how it felt just psychologically, or if they are actually all part of an emotional work in those moments. So. The challenge with the piece is, um, is to be completely off the cuff and to be still deciding on whether or not to follow through with the inkling that I had, the idea that I had to, to, um, to make change. And I think throughout the entire piece, Nate is trying to come to terms or trying to understand um, if this really is what he wants to do, or if this is what he needs to do. Um, so as, essentially, I think at that point when, you know, we, we marched, we kneeled, we voted, um, he's beginning to make this decision that, you know, he is going to become a martyr. Um, and I think he doesn't truly make the decision. Me and Steve had this conversation uh, plenty of times. We were, we were trying to find when is the point at which 
he decides there is no turning back. You know, there becomes a point where, you know, you cannot go anywhere but forward. And, you know, you're, you're done making up your mind. And um, Steve and I agreed that that point began whenever uh, he recited the, the Bible verse. Um, and that was, that was a little after we marched, we kneeled. But um, uh, I think they're, they're, different, they're definitely two different when, whenever he's saying to his son uh, and when he's talking about uh, we marched, we kneeled, they're different uh, because he's still trying to figure out what it is that he's going to do and if he's going to sacrifice himself and leave his son uh, fatherless, essentially, um, um, because I think that this is this is a, this is a suicide mission, really. Um, um, and it, it was it was it was so challenging because, I, like Steve said, he crafted in the text where he didn't want it to be one mood, um, and you know, there's riffs where I'm firing off. There's uh, moments where I'm I'm still trying to think in my own head. There's moments where I'm talking directly to my son. Um, and I think, you know, that was probably my favorite moment near the end when I am directly addressing him, already have made up my mind uh, what I'm going to do. And I'm giving him, uh, uh, I'm basically telling him, you know, to, to remember me as a man um, and remember that, I'm, I'm, that it's honorable and it's noble to fight for what you believe in. And I think that's the overall, um, which Steve likes to call it the drone of a piece. Uh, to, um, you know, that's, that's what he wanted to impress upon his son, um, that it's, it's important to fight for what you, you know, to, 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 if you have to die, you know, to, to fight for what you believe in, then, you know, you might as well die on your feet than on your knees. Um, so, so yeah, I, I wanted to convey two very different emotions, and I, I hope that was, that was clear uh, in that uh, delivery of it. But it's definitely in the beginning, we marched, we kneeled. He's still trying to figure out if he's going to actually follow through. I love how it actually puts death not necessarily as the end. And it kind of, mm. uh, because we already said, like, if, it, we, if we survive, just living under these conditions, it'll be amazing. Yeah. So the idea of the deciding um, mm -hmm. is interesting. Is like, it almost doesn't make it about the decision to live or die. I don't <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is about the decision to stay of what your legacy is. It's more about your legacy than anything else. Yeah, my legacy and, and, and what it means to be, you know, uh, to, to, you know, raising black sons is, is a very complex thing in itself. I think we have to, to, to raise these black boys in, in a way that, that a lot of people from other races wouldn't understand, um, you know, the different, you know, uh, strategies that we have to tell them, you know, don't drive around in your car with a white beater on uh, or a tank. Um, don't, don't wear your do-rag outside of your house. Um, uh, you know, there's so many different rules and regulations that we kind of have to police ourselves so that we don't have to, you know, get involved with the police. And so I think, um, uh, Ultimately, Nate is of the generation that's like, nah, I'm about to lay these hands on you. And I think a lot of young people now are more, are more um, Malcolm than Martin. And, I, I, you know, Nate uh, paying homage to um, uh, Nat Turner, uh, you know, he, he's, he's a rebellious spirit and he, he, won't, he won't take this uh, sitting down anymore. And I think that's that's the kind of idea that's proliferating across a lot of young Black Americans today. Is uh, you know, there's a time like in the beginning. There's a time for for war. There's a time for peace. Uh, there's a time for love. There's a time for hate. And I think right now we're in the time of the, the time of war. Um, so, yeah, it, the decision I think it was the big thing for me is is finding that point in where this decision is being made and then making it super clear that, um, that there was no turning back. That, thank you for that. So Omkar, I have agents on this call. <laughs> as, a young, as a young person and, def, and you know, as um, 
from the account kind of have the uh, the race relations and how much race actually affects how we're all living with each other. I'm curious going forward in your career, what kind of work you're interested in making. Um, I mean, I know that's a really big question, but I know because you've been working with Steve um, and with our, other artists of color, I'm really curious about um, maybe what kind of thoughts you have about your future in this field. Yeah, that is a pretty big question. Uh, I, can, I can sum it up in saying that um, art and theater, film, movies, music and all has affected me who I am today. And it shaped my, uh, like I tell people in America, my understanding of America came from the movies I would watch about America or what college in America is of what the movies are. And with uh, these movies and films and theater were like safe spaces for me and made me feel like, uh, helped me grow. And I wanna set that up for people like me because growing up, I wouldn't see people like me in uh, television or in movies or anything in, in like in the forefront, whereas living for a short period of time in Silicon Valley, there were a lot of people who looked like me, but there weren't a lot of people who were like me on TV and what, or, or in music and whatnot. They were back in India. And so that's where I want to go. I Means even in India, when I started doing arts, I used to do a lot of arts, uh, which was based in social change against the government or in, uh, which was stemmed by what was happening politically in India. So then when I met Steve and I read through the work and saw the work that Steve does, I was like, man, this man is doing the work, like the work work, which is not only, it's not only entertaining, but it's also helping society move on forward and giving people a platform. And that was, uh, that's why I, well, any day, any time, I will work with Steve because Steve just knows how. He, he's figured out the code. He's figured it out. Like he knows it. He knows it by down. So yeah, no, there. That's that's what I'm predominantly. I can speak about that now. I'm still young. I'm still 21. Still in college. So first, I'm gonna get this degree, and then I'm gonna go out and <laughs> I'm gonna go out and try to change, uh, shape the world, make it better. Like. And Nate, uh, Nate says, make it better for, for you and me. So for other people who look like me and other disenfranchised people, just help them out as much as I can. That's great. Thank you. I sprung that question <laughs> on you. <laughs> okay. so, Steve, I want to give you the last word. What are you hoping this piece can potentially inspire for those that see it? Um, I know that's also a massive question. So. Um, I am hoping for an, a world where there is an anti-racist world, that there's equality for everyone. I mean, just the dream that Dr. Martin Luther King always says, we're just moving more toward it. And I'm hoping that in writing this, there are basic human needs that we all share. Safety, security is at the base of the Maslow Triangle of hierarchy of needs. And any time that you take away those from any human being, um, it, there, it will cause a resistance or a, a, an issue of survival, because that's what this is about. And everyone deserves basic human needs. That's what the piece is about, <laughs> you know? And when you take them away from any human being, they will strive to get their basic human needs met. And we all deserve them. So I'm hoping that, you know, it can have some empathy. You know, I hope you see someone, you see yourself, because I believe in, in intrinsically, we are all one, right? My spiritual beliefs, we're all one. It's all one, all one spirit, all one. I am my brother, not my brother's keeper. I am my brother. So if you see yourself, and that's what they, the, what George Floyd, that ignited in all of us, there is no way as a human being, you can see another human being murdered in that capacity that that not affect you. And, and an equity for one is an equity for all. So I hope it ignites change 
just change for equality for everyone. Thank you so much. And it is, I love the idea uh, that it's all in terms of like, of seeing and awareness. Mm -hmm. And at this moment, it's taken to this moment for that, you know, kind of awareness of people's humanity, which feels like should be a baseline to begin with. But here we are. Um, and now what do we do? What are the next steps? Now that we see it, now that we know it. And, and I would like to add, it's so interesting, Gina, today I woke up and I was like, wow, okay, so the piece that's coming up whenever we get back in the world with People's Light is the Bayard Rustin um, inside Ashton. Here you had Bayard Rustin, they sit brother of each other. Bayard Rustin was a pillar for nonviolence, right, for change. Nate, the contemporary hero of resistance, is what I want to call him, of Nat Turner, was on the opposite. There are many ways to revolt. I think you need all of them for change. You know what I mean? So I don't judge any of them. I'm personally not a person of violence, and um, because um, it disturbed me even when I remember writing it and going to bed two nights really um, bothered. I was like, oh my gosh. Um, but I do understand that um, violence begets violence. I don't think it encourages or I condone it, but for some, I, I have a quote, only a catalytic act could convince the archetypes of a violent social order that violence begets violence. Mm -hmm. Period. Mm -hmm. I do not condone it, but you cannot continue any human being. You know what I mean? Your, your dog will bite you back <laughs> without mistreatment. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Our human basic needs for everybody. And, and again, I'm a, I mean, I'm more fire Rustin, but it's interesting how they sit across from each other. Um, of, of, uh, I'm more nonviolence. I'm more, you know, but however, you know what I mean? Uh, there are many forms of revolt and I think all are necessary. And it's a lifetime of work. <laughs> yes, lifetime. Right. So, and the fun passes on. But this is, but it's urgent. So it's like, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's <laughs> so welcome to the struggle. <laughs> yes. Um, I have to, I mean, just to honor Don Lewis too in this moment, just thinking of that. Um, yeah. As you were talking, I just thought of that um, in terms of Byron Rustin's work too, and the tirelessness with which Byron continued to work. And, um, you know, that a lot of, activists certainly of a certain generation have just continued to really try to meet the world with love as mm -hmm. well which is mm -hmm. always so inspiring yeah but yeah. i love i mean this quote has been around so but that ours is not the struggle of one day one week or one year ours is not the struggle of one judicial appointment or presidential term ours is the struggle of a lifetime or maybe even many lifetimes and each one of us in every generation must do our part. Mm -hmm. So for those that are in it, for those that are leading, for those that are going to graduate and yeah. go at the world. <laughs> <Woo>! <laughs> so let this be the moment. And thank you, Steve, for offering this piece for us to have this conversation. Hey, thank everybody. These gentlemen, I couldn't have done it without. Thank you, people's like Zach, um, Umkar, Eric, y'all know y'all my for life. <laughs> Uh -huh. So um, I love, love, love you guys. And it, it is beyond anything I could dream of the project, it, what, what we ended with. So I'm so grateful. Thank you. Great. So thanks to Thank you all. so much, Gina. Yeah. Thank, Gina. You. Thank you so much.